Good morning, everybody. Great to be here, and I want to appreciate the invitation I received from Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Freeman. Marilyn, thank you for having me be a part of this forum. Um, as Jeff said, um, I'm responsible at TRADOC for the basically trying to help the Army think about the future across the board, not just of materiel, but of course all of, across all of LPF. And so it's a pleasure really today to be able to uh, talk to you about the work we're doing to help chart the Army's future direction to achieve an operationally adaptive force, one that is uh, both affordable and fully capable of meeting the challenges of the future. And a very for important aspect, obviously, in all of this is maintaining our edge. And I make that statement uh, uh, very succinctly, that we need to maintain our edge uh, in the world competitive environment, not just in the environment uh, that we like to operate in inside of our military or inside of our army. More about that later. But we need to maintain our edge in science and technology in the global competitive environment. And to that end, uh, humans are our most adaptive systems. They're decision makers, they sense, they shoot, they hand out food, they make a machine do something perhaps that it wasn't designed to do. They're curious. They adjust and gain advantages. They want to survive. They have a desire to live to the end of the conflict. Those are some of the unique characteristics of, of our, our humans, our soldiers, our leaders. And we've achieved some level of overmatch as a military and as a nation in the commons in areas such as sea and, and air, uh, but perhaps we haven't yet to achieve that same level of overmatch on land and in particular in the human dimension and in particular uh, the individual element of our squad squad, which is the pacing item of our brigades across our formation, um, and how can we help uh, to get that human, that squad, uh, to have the overmatch advantage uh, needed on the battlefield of tomorrow in this era of persistent conflict where humans are our most adaptable system. We're facing many cha challenges across the globe, and one of the biggest challenges in in determining how to help that human is understanding the baseline of the human's activities, the, the, the baseline of the human's performance. And according to 2006 data provided the U.S. Department of Education, as an example, the math literacy scores of 15-year-olds in the United States are lower than the average score in 23 of the other 29 Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, countries. In science literacy, the average score of 15-year-olds in the United States was lower than the average score in 16 of the other 29 OECD countries. Let me have the video, please. So whether you believe that uh, Jay Leno staged all that, or that this is perhaps a perception of the lack of education from the people that Jay Leno interviewed, as you might have noticed, many were on college campuses. Combined with the decline in our student scores in math and science, does that give us a weak signal, or maybe a strong signal, that we should be tracking? Is that a leading or lagging indicator or a metric on the future of the United States, and how might that be directed towards science and technology? That's a little bit about what I want to talk about today. What are some of the other potential weak signals? Information technology, U.S. ranks 13th out of 15th highly developed countries in household broadband penetration. Europe's energy fusion program is two and a half times that of the United States, and Japan's is one and a half times that of the United States. Aerospace industry from 1998 to 2003 the balance of trade fell from 39 billion to 24 billion due to outsourcing. Biotechnology, the output of China's pharmaceutical industry grew by 20% per year from 2000 to 2004. Technical educations 
ratios of first de degrees awarded in natural sciences and engineering in the U.S. were about 5.7 per 100. Yet Spain, Ireland, Sweden, UK, France, Finland were between 8 and 13 per 100. Japan, 8 per 100. Taiwan and South Korea, 11 per 100. Some 78 percent of the science and education or engineering doctoral degrees in 2000 um, were outsourced from the U.S. The number of articles published in science and engineering in between two, uh, 1988 and 2001 in the U.S. Per, grew by about 13 percent, but Western Europe grew by 60 percent, Japan and East Asia, um, China, Singapore, South Korea by almost 500 percent. So we got some challenges. Patent applications. While the U.S. increased by about 116 percent over the period 88 to 2001, again, East China, East Asia, China, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, grew by nearly 750 percent. Our high-tech sector also doubled during that period of time, but China's grew more than eight times. Historians will show that the Roman and British empires declined over a long period, and they have identified many reasons for its decline. Perhaps we can learn something by looking at those weak signals as well. In General Dempsey's phrasing, General Dempsey, the commanding general of TRADOC, as well as the 9-11 Commission, perhaps they failed due to a lack of imagination and a lack of the ability and desire to look at themselves and the world around them and then to adapt to survive. The United States is not an empire. I'm not suggesting that. Nor am I suggesting that the solution to empire decline falls on the shoulders of the military alone. But we have many very similar weak signals available to us today in our country and in our military. And while we are improving, we are not necessarily keeping pace with the leaders in the international community. The global trends on this chart are the ones we are seeing today. The bullets in red on this chart represent some of the global trends that have also been referenced as aiding in decline of the Roman and British empires. One could, could identify two prevailing broad trends of particular import as economy and values. First, to the, to the economy. Uh, very difficult to predict what the future uh, will entail for us, but it is clear that there is an unprecedented shift in relative wealth and economic power from the West to the East, and most political pundits predict that that will continue. Our adversaries view our economy as perhaps the center of gravity. Whatever you believe and whatever you think about that future, it is clear that this instability and uncertainty associated with our, our economy breeds instability globally. War broke the last Great Depression. The Army, as a part of the Defense Department, faces hard choices between people and modernization, or even reset. Resources continue to be globally competitive and a global challenge for not only us as a nation, uh, but the many nations that we are allied with. China and India have increased their petroleum national energy usage. Water resources could potentially lead to conflict as well as critical rare earth minerals we need for industrialization and technology applications. Failing and, and failing states provide the fodder for international crime, criminal governments, and international adventurism to prosper. They also contribute to human malaise, forced migrations, rampant crime, and broad-based human predation. It creates more conflict and terror. Adding climate change into this slurry makes a very bleak prediction for future without potential political leadership intervening to change that course 
or corresponding use of various elements of the national power. Competition in the future will be among not only nation states, but multinational corporations and financial entities, some criminally led. Globalization exacerbates a world of haves and have-nots, and for the first time, people all over the world are acutely aware of their inequalities. Youth, bul youth bulges lead conflicts and fuel instability. Many of our allies today are not maintaining birth rates that will maintain the same ethnic composition and similar democratic or political views of the world could lead to changing alliances. These diverse nation state populations under duress could fall back on family, tribal, religious, and ethnic loyalty groups, resulting in increasing ethnic conflict fractures. Science and technology is key in many areas to the resolution of this, not only to make that human more efficient and, and more effective, but across the board to maintain the overmatch if our country wants to retain the position it has within the world or in its areas of diplomatic, informational, military, and economic power. Some of the key areas include cyber warfare, biotechnology, bionics, and pharmacology, as well as nanotechnology. Uh, these cybercrime, of course, uh, is a threat not only to our U.S. economy, um, as cybercrime revenues have surpassed those of the international drug trade uh, in 2005, uh, but it is a man-made domain and an increasing niche vulnerability for the U.S. across the board. Biotechnics, biotechnology, and bionics and pharmacology um, create massive potential for convergence in biointerfaces between the human brain and advanced computers, enhanced cognitive power, fly-by thought, prosthetics controlled by thought, nootropics, the use of drugs to enhance human performance, sharpening focus, cognition, and memory in modest use now, explodes. Nanotechnology offers revolutionary capabilities in materials, medicine, manufacturing, and food production, and can be used in most applications to include space. Technology can make flawed, injured brains perhaps work better. But many of these technologies have both a positive and a negative side. 